What if your long COVID is actually caused by a dormant Epstein-Barr virus? Stay tuned to learn what Epstein-Barr is, how it affects your body, and what you can do to reverse your symptoms and heal your long COVID. Hello and welcome to this growing community of people who are ready to heal from weird mystery symptoms that conventional medicine doesn't have answers for. I'm Carrie Bailey, your functional nutritionist. I work with people with anxiety, depression, and long COVID. We use specific therapeutic foods, supplements, and herbs to heal. Maybe you've already noticed the similarities between long COVID and Epstein-Barr virus. Things like fatigue, dizziness, brain fog. Let's start with what is the Epstein-Barr virus. The Epstein-Barr virus was discovered 60 years ago by Anthony Epstein and Yvonne Barr, although the virus has likely been around for more like 100 years. Epstein-Barr has been linked to cancers, autoimmune disease, multiple sclerosis, thyroid problems, dizziness, brain fog, Lyme disease even, and many more weird mystery symptoms. Given the health of our current population, I would say that Epstein-Barr virus continues to get stronger and stronger as time goes by. At this point, almost everybody has the Epstein-Barr virus. Does that surprise you? You might be wondering, how did I get Epstein-Barr? Well, it's really easy to pick up, honestly. And when, it, when it's, it's the most highly contagious stage of its life, it can spread through blood, saliva, and bodily fluids. You can acquire it even in utero during your mom's pregnancy. Hospitals don't screen for Epstein-Barr, so if you've ever had to have a blood transfusion, you definitely could have gotten Epstein-Barr that way. And again, as I said earlier, it is transferred by bodily fluids. So things like kissing and sex. You're more likely to get Epstein-Barr if your immune system is run down from stress, traumatic events, being deficient in zinc, B12, or vitamin C, right? It just makes the perfect environment for it to get in there and start attacking. Whereas if your immune system is strong, <clears throat> when it comes into your body, it's not going to do much. In fact, it's actually likely that when you first get it initially, you might not even know that you got it. It's not until it gets into your body and replicates and grows, and then it will, and then an event will trigger the symptoms. A lot of people know Epstein Barr as the first sign that they might get is mono. And mono is what most doctors would say they as an Epstein Barr indicator. You can get mono in your college years when you're out partying and you're out late and you're drinking alcohol and you're drinking caffeine and you're kind of <laughs> enjoying your college days. But you can also get mono as a kid, and it may or may not be diagnosed as mono, an episode of a severe fatigue, et cetera. You also get Epstein-Barr when your immune system is weak or worn down. Maybe you've got nutrition deficiencies. Maybe you've got a heavy viral load. Um, maybe you've been under a lot of stress, or you've been taking medications like steroids, which suppress your immune system. This creates an opening for Epstein-Barr to grow and replicate and to cause harm. Let's talk about um, what Epstein-Barr does in the body. Mono is technically, it's actually the second stage. So once it gets past that stage, it actually starts growing and really starts battling against your immune system. It can actually move into your organs like your lymphatic system. It can move into your reproductive organs for both males and females. It can create infertility, PCOS, uh, PMS. So that might look like heavy bleeding and cramps, which, you know, a lot of people say, oh, it's a hormonal issue. Mm, is it? Or maybe it's Epstein-Barr. It can get into your liver and it might look like fatty liver. It might look like a stagnant and sluggish liver. It can also get into your lymphatic system. Your spleen is sort of your lymphatic system's major organ and it controls your white blood cells and your red blood cells and your platelets. Its job is to remove the old and damaged blood, red blood cells. The spleen can become enlarged or painful or also just not function well. One indication of this might be fluid retention, right? Which you might notice in your body, like sometimes people notice it in their hands. I know I notice it on my ankles when I'm wearing socks and I'll have that sock indentation. It's important to know where your spleen is in case you have pain there. Now it's gonna be on your left, upper left side of your abdomen. I don't know if you can see that, but upper left side of your abdomen, it's actually tucked up under your ribs and it's above your stomach. And so you're going to want, if you followed sort of your left nipple down and just under your ribs, that's where you're going to feel it. So if you feel pain there, just understand that distinction between your spleen and your stomach. So once it's in your liver, it can do things like reduce your hydrochloric acid, which is so important for you to be able to break down and digest your food. You want that hydrochloric acid to be like battery acid, not like vinegar, right? And if you're not digesting well, that's a good chance that 
your food is just sort of pushing its way through your digestive system and likely putrefying and causing potentially constipation and bloating. This can also lead to food sensitivities if you've never had those before. Other signs that you might have Epstein-Barr is elevated hemoglobin A1C. Um, that's one of the factors they look for in type 2 diabetes. High cholesterol, hepatitis, food sensitivities, low stomach acid or signs of low stomach acid, right? Like bloating, constipation, poor digestion. You might feel just like you have some kind of toxic GI or leaky gut. The next stage that Epstein-Barr goes into is like stage three, I guess we could call it. And that's when it actually starts nesting in your organs. So if it starts nesting in your liver, for instance, it could present itself as weight gain. Now you think of this, if you think about different times in a person's life where they start gaining weight, you might notice <clears throat> that te teenagers start gaining weight after puberty, right? So again, is that the Epstein-Barr getting all, using all those yummy hormones and starting to grow and nesting in your liver? Or postpartum is another time when people, after they have babies, they gain weight and they can't let go of it. Again, lots of hormones happening in that time. And that those hormones, if your liver's not working well, your body can't get rid of those. And then, you know, your Epstein-Barr is just going to, feed on those hormones and grow. You might have heard of Epstein-Barr for your thyroid, which again is another gland. It can impair its function. Its job is to produce T4 and then your body converts that into T3. You can also get nodules or worse, you can actually get thyroid cancer. Again, Epstein-Barr is likely the culprit at the base of those illnesses. Epstein-Barr 2 in this later stage is stage three can actually start producing neurotoxins. So it's just like you said, it's toxins that get into your brain, into your nervous system and start impacting how you think and how you feel in your body. A neurotoxin poisons your nerve function. It can also kill healthy cells in your organs and in your connective tissue. It can start inflaming your vagus nerve. We've talked about, if you're new to this channel, welcome. We've talked about the vagus nerve a lot on this channel, right? Which runs from your head to the longest nerve. It runs down and that can become inflamed. And so that might look like that neurotoxin inflammation might look like digestive issues. When it's in stage three, it can also confuse your immune system, right? It's got the neurotoxins and can create brain fog and things like that. So it starts confusing your immune system and your immune system can't fight it. So if your immune system is not strong enough and it gets confused, it's going to have a hard time fighting it and it allows it to grow more. Epstein-Barr in this um, stage three can also create what's called dermatoxins. And it's just like it sounds, it's derma, derma skin, right? So it can create a rash. This could look like eczema or psoriasis. And again, that's just the virus's waste that creating a poison that is damaging your skin. In stage four of Epstein-Barr, this is when the really weird mystery symptoms start coming in. This includes neurological symptoms like the stuff you're getting with long COVID. It inflames your central nervous system. It makes you feel like your limbs are floating. It might feel like pins and needles. It might feel like stinging, tingling, burning, or this feeling like an electrical sensation that's in your head or in your body. This can also lead to a, more feelings of anxiety and panic attacks. And these aren't the same as what other people think of anxiety as, and panic attacks. Sometimes anxiety people think of as stress, or they think of it as an events in their life, people they encounter with, right? It's not that type of anxiety. This is a physiological anxiety, a panic attack, this people feel like it's erupting from their body, like their body is triggering this more than their head is triggering it. It's in this fourth stage of Epstein-Barr that I see most frequently what the, we're calling long COVID is the Epstein-Barr reactivation. This is where you're getting your brain fog, your dizziness, when people aren't methylating well, right? I notice this a lot when they're sensitive and they're very reactive to foods and supplements in the environment. It's really reactive stage is a later stage of Epstein-Barr. This becomes the perfect storm for Epstein-Barr to get in there and create that cytokine storm, that perfect storm um, again, it's that whether it was triggered by COVID or whether at the same time you had stress or right, all the factors, everybody's story is different about how they got here. But again, it's that 
unearthing this Epstein-Barr virus. And it's these events that allow Epstein-Barr to grow and replicate and then start triggering symptoms. As I mentioned before, if you're low in zinc, if you're low in vitamin B12, you're deficient in those nutrients and this thing sets in, you're more likely to get sick. And you're more likely to get symptoms. You could have stressful time or struggle and betrayal and all the things, right, in your life, whether it's car accident or mental emotional stress, a fight with a loved one, you know, there's so much, you know, mental, emotional stuff that goes on. It's important to understand the things that reduce your immune system because you want your immune system and your entire life to be as robust as possible so you can fight against this. So if you are currently struggling with long COVID and you've got a weak immune system, one of your first tasks is to build it up and to look for things that are weakening your immune system and fix them. So during really stressful times, right? Um, you have a stressful living situation, a stressful job, you know, can you change jobs? Can you get out of that situation? You know, was there a breakup that you can't really control? The events like this can lead to stress, which leads, you know, it's this domino effect of then you can't sleep. And if you can't sleep well, you can't heal. And it's important to sleep during that window between <clears throat> 10 p.m. and 2 a.m. If you can get sleep in this window, you are golden. This is the healing window. If you're staying up late because you can't fall asleep or you're staying up late trying to deal with things or just chill out and you're not going to bed till one, you're losing three hours of that healing window, right? So that would be one of my first recommendations, which we'll talk about later, is to get into bed by 10 o'clock each night in order to start healing from Epstein-Barr. Sometimes people say, okay, well, can I test for it? Or I tested for it and they said I didn't have it. And you can test for it, but it doesn't always show up. It doesn't always show up on a blood test because it depends on what stage it's in. It might not even be in your blood. A later stage Epstein-Barr might already be in your tissues and your organs and not even in your bloodstream. It's always important to not just rely on a test, but to look at the whole picture. This is why I always have a very personalized and individualized approach because I have to look at the symptoms and the symptoms are the true guide to healing, right? If you can get those symptoms to go down, you know you're moving in the right direction possibly, but we've talked about like during, like if you're on carnivore or you're intermittent fasting, how that actually might be feeling good, but you're not actually healing. For myself, I was diagnosed with Epstein-Barr in my forties. I'd gone to a naturopath because I was struggling with fatigue, sleep issues, and pain. And she tested me and sure enough, I, my antibodies were positive for Epstein-Barr. And I said, great, how do we get rid of it? And she said, you can't, there's no way to get rid of it. And I was like, okay, what do we do? She didn't actually give me what to do with it, but I figured it out on my own later down the road. So there is no way to get rid of it, but you can keep it from becoming a problem by addressing nutrient deficiencies, keeping your immune system strong, eating whole foods. You know, it's virtually impossible to totally eradicate Epstein-Barr, right? It's always in our body once we have it but you can reduce symptoms, you can reverse symptoms, doing your best to eat the right way and take the right supplements, you can keep it at bay. So there's a couple other tests besides blood tests where Epstein-Barr gets a little confused with other issues. Obviously a virus is um, a living thing and when it dies, it has a body, it has a, a viral casing, if you will. And that viral casing, when a virus dies, it has a life cycle of six weeks. And so when as the viruses die, those casings have to go somewhere. And those might be in your bloodstream, they might be in your stool. When you get tested for blood, urine, or stool, and the test comes up and sees these, they look like spirochetes, they look like Lyme, they look like the Borrelia bacteria in Lyme. And so people say, oh, okay, you have Lyme, but really was it Lyme or was it really an actual Epstein-Barr casing? Now this casing, again, can present itself in stool testing, come out in your stool, <clears throat> and because the stool test doesn't, not all stool tests look at the whole organism, they might just look for body parts of organisms, and then they might identify that as parasitic activities. So they might say, oh, you have a parasite, you kill it, you get rid of it, and yet you still have the symptoms of Epstein-Barr. Before we start talking about exactly what you can do to reduce and kill your Epstein-Barr, which is causing your long COVID symptoms, I want to tell you that I've been working on something really special for you guys. It's my long COVID recovery guide. It's an amazing tool that I'm building for you, and it's my essential steps to healing long COVID. And I'm so excited to share it with you. My long COVID recovery guide is going to be coming soon. I'll pop a link in the comments in the description below 
so that you can get on the wait list. But once you get on that wait list, you get an email with some tips to get you started while you wait. All right, let's jump in what you can do. The number one is stop feeding the pathogens. The pathogens love the processed foods, eggs, dairy, gluten, corn, soy, pork, because it's high in fat and canola oil. What you want to eat is whole fruits and vegetables, but you want to be sure to reduce your overall fat intake. Because as I've spoken about before, if you've watched me, that fat in your bloodstream is thickening your blood and not making room for nutrients, oxygen, and water. If you're eating animal protein, you can just reduce it. Can you just reduce it to once a day instead of two or three times a day? If you're eating a whole cup of nuts or seeds in a day, can you reduce it to half a cup, right? So start reducing your fat. You want to eat as many fruits and vegetables each day as you can. I know that sounds so cliche, but then people are like, well, how do I really do that? Because this is a different way than we're taught to eat. And this is very different than carnivore and keto. These are the foods, the fruits and vegetables are the things that feed your good bacteria. And they really do kill Epstein-Barr virus and other viruses and bad bacteria. So there's two foods you want to bring in in order to replace the satiating calories of fat, right? So fat satiates you, but so do you if you eat enough calories. The satiating feeling you're going to get is when you bring in either fruit or starchy vegetables, right? That's going to satiate you. A, a leafy green salad alone will not satiate you, right? You're going to need avocado or, or something to fill you up. Each day, you also want to eat as many as possible as leafy greens. So this would be spinach, arugula, any kind of lettuce, butter lettuce, romaine lettuce. You want to eat some of this every single day. And if you haven't been eating it, you know, start with a handful. See if you can increase to a whole salad. Can you eat a whole salad every day? Foods like grains and beans and nuts and seeds aren't going to hurt you per se, but they are taking up extra room for the more healing foods. I would always say, instead of a grain, can you bring in a potato or starchy vegetable? Yeah. Same thing with beans, right? Rice and beans is okay. You know, it's gonna, <laughs> you're gonna survive on rice and beans, but it's not going to heal you. The one food that is amazing at killing Epstein-Barr is potatoes, believe it or not. Potatoes are high in lysine, which is an amino acid we'll talk more about later, but that it's really good for viruses. And Potatoes heal the digestive tract. They stabilize your blood for sugar. Now, when you first start eating potatoes, right, it might seem like it's spiking your blood sugar. So I will warn you because there's a lot of healing that has to happen before you can get your blood sugar regular. So if you're already struggling with diabetes, already struggling with elevated morning glucose or hemoglobin A1C, you're going to want to put these in, know that they're going to spike your blood sugar, but over time, it should come down. The important way to eat it is without fat. If you haven't been eating potatoes because you've been on a low carb or keto or carnivore diet, again, initially it's going to raise your blood sugar, but understand that, you know, your pancreas has some healing to do. Your liver has to heal, do some healing. To maximize your healing, you want to eat these potatoes without butter, oil, or fat of any kind. This includes animal protein. So the whole like <laughs> burger and a fries, that's the thing that's going to kill you. That's the thing you want to avoid. Let's jump into, again, I mentioned this earlier, but I'm going to say it again, is that the sleep that you get from 10 to 2 is a really important healing window. And again, if you're struggling with fatigue, you're struggling with long COVID and all those symptoms, ideally try to get asleep by 10, sleep till 2 in that window, and that will help you. And if you can't sleep, well, then pop a comment below and let's talk about it. All right, let's jump into some of the key supplements that you're going to need if you have Epstein-Barr or you suspect you have Epstein-Barr and that's what's causing your long COVID. Okay, number one, you're going to want to strengthen your immune system. This means your body needs a lot of zinc and a lot of B vitamin C. So I've talked about those nutrients in other videos and you can go watch those if you want to get dosages and forms, et cetera. A lysine is another nutrient that I love to bring in. It helps your body fight not just Epstein-Barr, but all viruses, right? So whether your long COVID is Epstein-Barr or a mix of a bunch of other viruses, lysine is your friend. This critical amino acid is depleted anytime there is a heavy viral load in the body. So you're likely deficient in it. Part of what we do when we're getting rid of Epstein-Barr is we're starving it. And the other part is killing it. <laughs> so we want to kill it. And so there are two herbs that you can take. You can get this in tea form. You don't have to get it in supplement form, but I talk about it in the supplement section. But the two herbs that can help kill Epstein-Barr are cat's claw. And again, you can get that in tea form or lemon balm. And 
lemon balm. It's not an or, it's an and. <laughs> Both of them would be really good. And, and lemon balm is amazing if you've got a lot of nervous system issues, you've got stress, you can't sleep well, that lemon balm is going to calm your nervous system and start allowing you to heal. So even having one or more cups of lemon balm tea every day is going to be amazing. So if you've enjoyed my video, give me a thumbs up consider subscribing to my channel so you can get more of my videos each week. If you have any questions, please pop a comment below. I love answering your questions. Thanks so much for watching. I'll see you in the next video.